So here we have uh, x is in a C star algebra A, so the C star algebra. Um, and we'll say that x1, uh, uh, we've already seen x is normal. If it commutes with its adjoint, so this is just some terminology. Uh, 2 x is self adjoint. If it is equal to its adjoint, which in particular implies normal, 3 x is positive. If x can be written as y star y for some y and a, so any element of the form y star y is positive. Um, I should remark, so for C star algebras, uh, 0 is 0 star 0, so the 0 operator is positive. Uh, so there's no non-negative for C star algebras, even 0 is positive. Um, so that's just terminology. That's just to avoid saying non-negative or anything like that. It just makes terminology easier. Um, X is unitary if X star X is equal to X X star is equal to 1. So you need a unital C star algebra to have the unitaries. Uh, 5 uh, X is an isometry. If just the first one happens, or we'll say it's a co-isometry, x is a co-isometry. If x x star is equal to 1, uh, 7 x is a projection. If x is self-adjoint, and it's an item potent. And 8x is a partial isometry. If x star x is a projection. All right, so that's uh, various terminology. So. Uh, you like the intuition maybe comes from B of H, which we know is an IC star algebra. And there, uh, unitary means exactly your unitary on the Hilbert space. Your unitary operator in isometry means you're an isometry on the Hilbert space, uh, the metric space. And same with projection. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'll leave it to you guys to realize if you're in B of H, then a projection is exactly a projection onto its range, so onto the closed subspace. So this agrees with our usual intuition from B of H. And partial isometry means restricted to, uh, so um, you look at the kernel, you restrict it to the orthogonal complement of the kernel, and then you're an isometry on the orthogonal complement of the kernel. Right, so that's what all happens in B of H, and so we'll just adapt that terminology uh, for an arbitrary C star algebra. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> kind of the most important for us in a C star algebra is the positive elements. Um, and uh, so it's not obvious at all from this definition that the positive elements uh, form a cone, that if you add two positive elements, you get another positive element, and it's a closed cone. Um, so that's the next step to prove. We started this last uh, lecture, let me remind you the lemma we proved, and that is that if we have two self adjoint elements, uh, such that the spectrum of x is contained in the non negative reals and the spectrum of y is contained in the non negative reals, so then the spectrum of x plus y is also contained in the non-negative reals. So this is what we showed last time. Uh, now we can uh, use this to show that the positive operators uh, uh, form a cone. So let's go and now prove a proposition. 
So again, we have x and a a c star algebra and x normal. So then we have the following conditions. One is that uh, x is self-adjoint if and only if the spectrum of x is contained in the reals. Uh, two is that x is positive if and only if the spectrum of x is contained in the non-negative reals. Three, x is unitary if and only if the spectrum of x is contained in the unit circle. And four, x is a projection if and only if the spectrum of x is contained in the two point set zero one. So as long as we restrict to normal elements, then we can read these various properties from their spectrum. Right? But uh, notice that we do restrict to normal elements, and this is not true in general. You could have non-normal elements, which are not projections, but their spectrum is just equal to the zero uh, singleton. Right? So this is, you can do this already in two by two matrices. It's easy to think of examples. So uh, you need to restrict to normal elements for this proposition. <laughs> okay, so let's prove this. So I think uh, almost all of these should be pretty easy with the, the powerful tool of uh, functional calculus. Uh, so we already proved before that if you're self-adjoint, then the spectrum's contained in the reals. Uh, but conversely, if the spectrum's contained in the reals, then that means that the spectrum um, uh, so we can look at the function, right? So one, if the spectrum of X is contained in the reals, well, let's consider the function F of Z, which is sent to Z bar. So then we know that F of X, on one hand, we know that this is X star, because this is just a nice polynomial. But on the other hand, we know that this only depends on the function on the spectrum, which is in the reals, which are it's the same as z. So we also know that this is the same as x. Uh, okay, uh, so that's uh, one. Uh, three is, should be similar. Uh, let's see, if uh, the spectrum of x is contained in the, in the circle, so if the spectrum of x is contained in the circle, then we can look at what is the spectrum of x star x. Well, um, this is just the spectrum of f of x, where f of z is just absolute value z squared. So in particular, it takes all the points in the circle to a singleton. So this is, um, uh, well, this is f of the spectrum of x, but this is contained in the circle, so this is equal to the singleton 1. Right? But on the other hand, this is a normal element. So a normal element uh, with singleton 1, then we know it's equal to 1. Right? So this implies for x star x is equal to one, and we already are assuming it's normal, so xx star also equals one. Um, uh, conversely, if we're a unitary, uh, then we can just go backwards, right? Because um, then we know that xx star is equal to one, but we also know that, uh, so that's equal to this, where f is equal to this, um, but that means that the spectrum of, uh, so this is the spectrum of f of x, which is the spectrum, well, we're reading it the other way around, right? So this, in that case, to go the other way around, this we know is equal to one. Therefore, it's equal to this. Therefore, uh, the range of the spectrum, uh, the spectrum have to has to live 
and the things which are sent to one, which is exactly the unit circle. Uh, okay, so we just read this backwards to get uh, three. Uh, and four is very similar. Uh, so if the spectrum is in zero, um, uh, if the spectrum is in zero one, we can consider the function uh, f of t is equal to t squared. Um, and we already know it's self-adjoint because of condition one, and we can consider this function, but this function is the same as f of t equals t on the set zero one. So again, uh, if the spectrum's in there, then t has to x has to equal x squared. Uh, and conversely, um, uh, if you're a projection, then it's the same, same thing by looking at this. So I'll let you guys figure out. The only non-trivial one is maybe if x is positive, if and only if this. So one direction is easy, that's what we already do here. So if, so this is for two, uh, if the spectrum of x is contained in zero to infinity, well then, what do we know? We can just write x is equal to the square root, or, well x is equal to uh, the square root of x times the square root of x. A functional calculus, so we can define square root of x because the spectrum is in here. Uh, but this is, uh, I mean, square root of x, this is self-adjoint also, so you have here that it's therefore non-negative. So we'll use this terminology, anything non-negative, we'll say it's greater than or equal to zero. Um, in general, I should maybe say that over here, in general we say x is less than or equal to y if uh, y minus x is positive. So that's the terminology, the notation we'll use in a C strip. Uh, so if the spectrum is contained in this, then we have that it's a positive uh, element. Uh, so the tricky, maybe slightly tricky part is the converse. That is, if we know that it's a positive element, then how do we know that a spectrum is contained in the non So now let's suppose x is equal to y star y. Now if y were normal, well then we could apply functional, we could use functional calculus tools there and we'd see that therefore this spectrum has to be uh, exactly. So if y were normal, this would be easy. The only non-trivial thing is if y is perhaps not normal. That's, that's the part we have to deal with. Uh, okay, so for that we'll use, uh, um, we can use a little trick. So, let's burn my notes. Yeah, so what we'll do, suppose x is equal to y, so y, we can write x is equal to x plus minus x minus, where, so x is self-adjoint, so we can apply functional calculus there. So x plus is, say, f of x, where f of t, we already know its spectrum is its self adjoint, so its spectrum on the real line. So f of t is this function, which is zero when t is negative and t when t is positive. So this gives us the positive part of x. And we have x minus is g uh, of x, where g of t has this graph right here. Right, so this graph is g of t. So then, uh, yeah, so our goal is to show that x minus doesn't exist, right? Because we know that x plus is positive because it's of this. Um, we know that the, I mean, we know that the spectrum of x plus is contained in the non-negative reals because it's the image of this function. Uh, and we know that the spectrum of x minus is contained in the non-negative reals. So if we could show that x minus is actually equal to zero, well, we'd just get x plus. So let's show that uh, x minus is equal to zero. So for that, let's set z to be, let me make sure I put it on the right, correct side. So y times x minus. Um, so then, the observation is that z star z 
is equal to x minus uh, x minus is self adjoint, so x minus y star y and then x minus. But y star y is x, and of course x commutes with all of this stuff. Uh, and what else do we know? We know that x minus times x is just uh, negative x minus squared, I guess. So we know that this is equal to negative x minus cubed. So that's just coming from functional calculus. Um, in particular, we have that therefore the spectrum of z star z is contained from in the non-positive set of non-positive reals because we know that for x minus and hence, well, negative x minus and hence also negative x minus cubed. Um, uh, on the other hand, we also know that the spectrum of zz star, we did this lemma on the very first, this was the first lemma we did in the class, that the spectrum of you know a times b is the same as the spectrum of b times a, except possibly at the origin is the only thing that can go wrong. So this is certainly contained in the spectrum of z z star union zero, and this is equal to the spectrum of z star z union zero, which is contained in negative infinity to zero. So. Uh, z, z star is also equal to this. But on the other hand, we can also decompose z as z equals uh, a plus ib, where a and b are self adjoint elements. Make sure I'm on track here. Yeah. So specifically, We've seen this before. A is z plus z star over 2, and b is z star minus z over 2 times i. So we could write z in this way as a linear combination of two self adjoint elements. And then using this decomposition, we can compute what is z, z z star z plus z z star. And uh, let's see, uh, if we were, if these were real numbers, we could just drop this, but since we're in a c star algebra and these, this need not be normal, we have to take both sides of these and add them together. Uh, and you'll see we get some cancellations. So we're gonna get, um, I see we're going to get an a squared coming from here. We're going to get an a squared coming from here. So this will be 2a squared. We're going to get a b squared coming from here. Another b squared coming from here. So plus 2b uh, squared. And then we get the cross terms. So here we have uh, an a and then an ib. But over here we have um, uh, we're going to have an a here, or a here and a negative ib here. And here we're going to pick up, um, I guess, a, a negative ib and an a. And here we're going to pick up a positive ib and an a. All right, so we see that the cross terms exactly cancel when we take the different ordering here. Right, so we just get exactly uh, this. Uh, in particular, uh, what can we, what do we know, uh, what did I want to say about this? We know that the spectrum, right, A and B are self-adjoint, so the spectrum here, we approve this lemma that I wrote right up here somewhere, that here the spec these are self-adjoint, they're spectrums in the non-negative real, so then it's true for the sum, so we don't need the A and B commute to know that. So we get, therefore, the spectrum of z star z plus z z star is contained in zero to infinity. Um, and now uh, what can we 
do, we can subtract uh, ZZ star. All right, so you get, therefore, the spectrum of Z star Z plus ZZ star plus negative ZZ star. Well, this spectrum we already know is contained in the non-negative reals, and ZZ star, we've showed right here, this in the non-positive, so hence negative is contained in the non-negative. And now we have a sum of two things, so this is also contained in zero infinity. But this is just z star z, which we also knew was negative infinity to zero. So it has to live in the intersection of these two sets. And the z, z star z star z is of course self-adjoint, and we now showed its spectrum contains of the singleton zero. So the conclusion is, is that uh, uh, z, z, z star z is equal to zero, which we already knew was equal to negative x minus cubed. But of course now we can apply functional calculus again, so now we get the x negative, x minus, this then implies that x minus is equal to zero, which is what we wanted to show. Okay, so a little bit of trickery there, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so y star y is self adjoint, right? Yes. So why can't we just take um, square root of y star y? Yeah. Um, and then like x is square root of y star y squared? Uh, square root of y uh, okay, so we could take, you're suggesting we do what? Square root of y star y the whole square. X is equal to square. Oh, but we don't know. That's exactly the point. We don't know what the spectrum. Square root. Square root. Uh, how do? We, how can we take square root? We need a continuous function defined on the spectrum. Yeah. So if we knew that the spectrum was contained in the non-negatives, we could do that no problem. All right. But here we don't know the spectrums. I mean, that's exactly what we showed. So that's why. All right. Any other questions about this? So, so there's no direct proof? This is pretty direct. <laughs> <laughs> this is direct, but like, um, like simpler. Simpler? I don't know. You're welcome to think of a simpler proof. This is the proof uh, that I found in some books. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know of a simpler proof. But, uh, I guess uh, <clears throat> at least on the abstract level. Now, if your take an operator in B of H, there's uh, simpler proofs. But of course, uh, we don't, here we have just abstract C star algebras. And uh, it's going to take, we first have to prove a theorem that every abstract C star algebra can be realized inside of B of H. Um, but in order to prove that theorem, we're going to need positive, we're going to need this result, right? So if we want to do this for abstract C star algebras, I, I don't know of a simpler approach, a quicker way. But this, I mean, it's, it's direct. I agree that it is a little bit of a trick and that um, if you just sat down and tried to work it out, it's not like you would, you know, it's not one of these direct things. It's one of these things that you struggle with for a while, then you find it, and then you go back and say, ah, oh, okay, this is how to write it. But it has some nice consequences. <clears throat> so one corollary I already mentioned is that um, the positive elements in a C star algebra form a closed cone. Uh, so why is that? That's because uh, 
Uh, we know that it's the same as being self-adjoint and having the spectrum in the non-negative reals, and we showed that that gives a cone, because that was the lemma we did at the end of class last time. So we have a cone, and then the closeness, um, uh, I'll leave to you guys as an exercise, but that's just because the set of self-adjoint elements whose spectrum is contained in the non-negative reals is going to be a closed subspace, and that's going to follow just from continuity of inversion. So. So then we get that this is a closed cone. So that's nice. So it behaves similar to how we'd expect in the real numbers or continuous functions on a, on a compact Hausdorff space, something like this. This works in general. Uh, let's see another corollary that I want to mention. Oh, here's kind of a fun corollary. Uh, the corollary of the previous proposition, uh, that is that um, X is a partial isometry if and only if X star is. All right, so we defined uh, a partial isometry, so i.e., another way to say this is that X star X is a projection. if and only if x, x star is, right, which is not entirely obvious if you sit down and think about it from an abstract C star algebra, how you would prove this, but this is completely obvious by the previous proposition because this is a projection, this is normal, so it's a projection if and only if its spectrum is in zero, one. But we know that the spectrum of AB is the same as the spectrum of BA, except possibly at the origin, but that doesn't change the fact. Right? So. The spectrum of this is in zero, 1, if and only if the spectrum of this is in zero. One. So that's, uh, all right. uh, yeah, so now that we know that the positive elements form a closed cone, here's, it makes sense to think a little bit about how much this intuition that it's like the positive real numbers uh, actually works. Question? Um, so, so, sorry, what was the cone again? Just closed under, closed under addition? Yeah. That's a cone. That's a cone. Yeah. I will end under scalar multiplication by a positive scalar or non-negative scalar. Yeah. Right. That's a cone. All right. So the following proposition. Uh, so suppose Uh, that we have uh, 0 less than or equal to x less than or equal to y, and this is all in some C star algebra A, A, C star algebra. So then uh, we also have that x square root of x is less than or equal to the square root of y. Uh, so remember when I write x less than or equal to y, what I mean by that is y minus x is a positive operator, meaning, meaning it's right. Uh, so then it's good. So also, if x and y are invertible, so then y inverse is less than or equal to x inverse. All right, so this is things, inequalities we know from the usual positive numbers. It's like we're going back to uh, elementary school mathematics, right, learning this sort of implication. Um, okay. So. When did you learn square root? Uh, seventh grade. Seventh grade? Okay. Seventh grade math. I a seventh grade really? Square root of an arbitrary real number. Yeah. yeah. Well, this is not. Uh, these are positive numbers. Square roots of positive numbers. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Square root of like four. Yeah, I mean probably. All right. But you're not. You you weren't. You didn't grow up in the U.S. Correct. Uh, oh, okay. All right. I mean, even I learned square roots before seventh grade. Maybe fifth or sixth grade. Uh, maybe, maybe 
Okay. All right. In Romania, this is the type of thing they teach you in kindergarten. So, there. All right. Uh, so let's let's prove this uh, elementary school, or sorry, uh, seventh grade fact. We'll prove this. Uh, all right. So uh, it's not quite, maybe not quite as easy as the in the usual real numbers, but uh, we we can handle this. Uh, so let's suppose. So we have zero less than or equal to x less than or equal to y. Oh, the main observation is uh, is that observe, I'll write it right here, observe, and this follows from the definition of positive operators being of the form y star y, and that is that the positive cone is closed under conjugation. Right? So if you have some a which is greater than or equal to zero, so then z star a z is also greater than or equal to zero, and this is for all z uh, and a. That's because if a is y star y, then this is yz, or is yz star yz. <clears throat> All right, so let's, uh, we'll just use this fact effectively to prove this proposition. So we have that uh, um, <clears throat> x is less than or equal to y. Uh, so we'll, to make our lives easier, let's first assume Assume, uh, so uh, this doesn't require a to be a unital c star algebra, I just wrote c star algebra. Uh, so this, I mean, if a has a unit and x and y are invertible, then, uh, so when I write x and y are invertible, I am, I'm implying that a has a unit. Uh, so let's go ahead and assume that we're in this case first. So assume uh, a has a unit and x and y are invertible. All right, so we have x is less than or equal to y. Well, what can we do? We can conjugate uh, by y square, the inverse of y square root, or the square root of y inverse, and then we get that, uh, therefore, y negative square root x y negative square root is less than or equal to 1. <clears throat> oh, I should have maybe mentioned this a little bit better. So if b is greater than or equal to a, <clears throat> that looks a little bit nicer because that's what the fact I'm using right now. Right? And you see this by just realizing that you can bring a to the outside and z star b minus a. Right? So. So this is a fact that I'm using. So conjugation preserves the order structure. So I did that with this formula up here, conjugating by y inverse. <clears throat> uh, but what does that mean? That means that uh, in particular, let's see, I think we can use this fact. Yeah, so therefore, if we now look at x, uh, one half y x uh, probably I want I want to look at positive square root here I think uh, yeah so positive square root x inverse so if we look at this element uh, it's also a self adjoint element and uh, any self-adjoint element, so maybe this is another fact we should verify, is always less than or equal to its norm. Right, why is any self-adjoint element uh, always less than or equal to its norm? Well, that's because look at the spectrum of this minus this, and that's self-adjoint element and spectrums and the positives, yeah? So this is definitely true. Any self-adjoint elements less than or equal to its norm, um, and uh, so then what can what can we say? Well, the norm. This is a normal element, so its norm is equal to its spectral radius. But now we can write this as square root of x times square root of y inverse. 
and then we have square root of y inverse times square root of x. So it's with a four a times b, and we use the fact the spectral radius of ab is the spectral radius of ba. So this is the spectral radius of y, or, and now we have x and then y. Right? Everybody okay with that? Uh, but now we have the fact that this is less than or equal to this. So therefore the spectral radius of this is less than or equal to one as well. So, uh, right, this is greater than or equal to zero. So less than or equal to one. But now we can take this formula and now we can conjugate by x inverse square root. So we get that therefore y inverse is less than or equal to x inverse. So that proved the second part of the theorem. Uh, but now we can use this to prove the first part of the theorem. We'll do a similar thing there uh, where we just The trick now is we want to look at what is y square root negative square root x over square root squared. So the norm of this we use the fact that this is uh, we we'll use the c star identity here and see that this is the norm of x square root y inverse x square root, which we already saw right there is less than or equal to 1. How uh, are we assuming invertibility for the first part? Yes, uh, so so far everything, we're assuming A as a unit and x and y are invertible. Oh, okay. Right. So this was a hypothesis for this, so we've done, we've done the second part. So now I'm going to prove the first part and still under the same hypothesis. Right, so the same assumptions, yes, exactly. Um, yeah. How did you get the, the equality from the norm to the first spectral radius? Uh, from this to this? Yes. Uh, because this element right here we know is um, <clears throat> uh, this, this, uh, I want to say that. Oh, because y is positive. Yeah, y, this is all greater than or equal to zero, yes? Y is positive. Uh, y, y is positive, so y inverse will also be positive by the previous theorem. So conjugating this will also be positive, so it's spectral, yeah, it's normal be equal. Exactly. All, right. all, all, of these, all of these things I've written down here are positive. Well, except this. This may not be positive. All right. Well, this is equal to this, which is less than or equal to 1. Uh, so therefore, what can we say? We can say now we just do this, what we are similarly did here, but with square roots. Uh, negative one fourth x square root y negative one fourth. That this is less than or equal to uh, <clears throat> that this again. This is positive, so we get a positive thing. So this is less than or equal to its norm, which is equal to its spectral radius. And now we again use the spectral radius to, that the product of AB is the same as BA. So this is spectral radius of what I've written there. I can move this over to here. Y. Uh, and the spectral, yeah, so the spectral radius is less than or equal to the norm. Which we showed up here is less than or equal. So now again, conjugating by y to the one fourth, we get therefore x to the one half is less than or equal to y one half. <clears throat> uh, 
All right, so this finishes the proof under the additional assumption that A has a unit and that X and Y are invertible. So now what to do in general? So in general, uh, we take A sitting inside of its unitization. So we, uh, we can assume X, so this doesn't affect whether or not X are positive or any inequalities right down here because that all has all to do with the spectrum, which is not, which we know doesn't affect how you embed into the C star algebra. Uh, so we can assume A has a unit. Uh, and then the thing to note is uh, if zero less than or equal to X less than or equal to Y, well, we already know that that implies in particular that the spectrum of X and the spectrum of Y are both contained in the sets zero to infinity. So this means that therefore, uh, for any t greater than zero, we have that zero is less than or equal to x plus t is less than or equal to y plus t. And we have that the spectrum of x plus t and the spectrum of y plus t is contained in the set t to infinity. In particular here, uh, we have that they're invertible elements. And now we can apply the previous proof. So we get therefore, the square root of x plus t is less than or equal to the square root of y plus t. But we also know, that by continuity of the functional calculus which we proved, that as t converges to zero, this converges to the square root of x, and as t converges to zero, this converges to the square root of y. And so that gives us then that x square root of x less than or equal to the square root of y. All right, any questions about that? Same argument, x to the minus 2 to the n, uh, that's that x to the y to the minus. Sure. Or you could ask x, um, so you have 0 less than or equal to x less than or equal to y. You could ask x to the um, t is less than or equal to y to the t. And uh, you can certainly try to mimic this argument. Uh, so it works almost the same. Uh, the only trickery here is that here we would want, I guess, uh, what, t here and t here. So you have to play some games with t and 1 minus t and, and to get this inequality here. But everything works fine uh, so long as t is between 0 and 1. Right? So this is if 0 is... Then everything goes fine. You can adapt this proof with a minimal effort. Um, so it's a bit easier to write with square roots, but uh, any. Uh, however, you can also naturally ask, well, from even now, it's even earlier than elementary school where you learn squares, right? Uh, squares is, you know, like kindergarten. Uh, or first, second grade? I don't know. When do you learn? Uh, so I. Um, however, for squares, this is not the case, in, in fact. In fact, here's a nice exercise uh, for you guys to think about, and that is suppose that A is a C star algebra such that uh, 0 less than or equal to x less than or equal to y implies x squared is less than or equal to y squared, and this is holds for all x and y and A. Suppose that this implication does hold, uh, so the conclusion is, is to prove that uh, A is abelian. Then in fact the intuition coming from, comp from the real numbers are abelian C star algebra, so of course it's obviously true for abelian C star algebra because you just do it pointwise. Um, but it's actually the only abelian, so already in the 2 by 2 matrices, for instance, you can find counter, counter examples. Uh, to this sort of behavior. 
So you have to, of course, choose X and Y, which don't commute, but uh, uh, it doesn't take too long to come up with counterexamples there. All right, so it's really only for square roots or less than one that we can do this sort of thing. All right, any questions on that? Here's a nice corollary, another corollary, which uh, is a useful implication, uh, is that if we have x and y in a Seaster algebra, uh, so then we have, we can consider the absolute value of x and y, so maybe we didn't define that uh, yet, so this is defined to be um, x, y star x, y. For any element in the Seaster algebra, we define the absolute value of that element. Oh, we forgot the square root. Right. So this is well defined by functional calculus. So that's how we define the absolute value of an element. Uh, and uh, the corollary is that absolute value of x, y is less than or equal to the norm of x times the absolute value of y. Yeah, because so uh, I mentioned we already know uh, we wrote that corollary up there that the positive elements form a closed cone. So what do we know here? We have to rewrite it so we know that square root of y plus t minus square root of x plus t that these are all positive elements for all t and this converges to square root of y minus square root of x. So therefore, this is also positive. Yeah. All right. So yes, you can take limits on either side just by taking the difference and noticing that the positives form a closed cone. Uh, yeah, so this is the corollary I wanted to mention. So the absolute value of x times y is always less than or equal to the norm of x times absolute value of y. Again, uh, you have to be a little bit careful when you use this. Uh, it is not always less than or equal to the norm of y times the absolute value of x. Right? So you do have to be aware of this. Uh, but the proof of this fact is pretty easy because I already, there's the formula there. So we have that the square root of y star x star x y. Uh, so this inside we already, I already mentioned that anything is always less than or equal to its norm, and conjugation preserves the order structure. So therefore, we have y star x star x, y is less than or equal to uh, the norm of x, y star y. So that's true. So now if we apply a square root to it, well, that still preserves it by the previous proposition. So this is less than or equal to um, the square root of the norm of, oh, this should be a squared here, norm of x squared y star y, which is the norm of x times absolute value y. But notice that here we had x star x was on the inside, which is why we could put the norm in there. So we can't do the same thing with y. 